Informative fisherman. <laughs> I forgot, we got a camera. Freaking man. <laughs> yeah. That's why we flip. Yes, sir. You can toss it and then you don't have one. <laughs> talking about that bass or me putting the pressure on this man. Nick is correct. Aaron's talking about building. The G Ring, right, baby? Yeah, yeah, Hypothetical yeah, there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. The Cheetos are delicious. <laughs> <laughs> Hey, what's up guys? Nick the Informative Fisherman here, and today I wanna to talk about some bass fishing in the winter. Um, I've seen other bass fishing winter related videos out there about their favorite lures and everything, and this is what you should be fishing in the winter time, but bass fishing is a game of percentages and better ideas. For example, everybody says, you know, throw a jerk bait in the winter, a drop shot, a shaky head and everything. Well, yes, it's because those ones tend to excel in the winter, but you should never outrule anything when it comes to bass fishing. Outruling anything or thinking there's a rule that you have to follow is going to limit you. Um, yeah, granted, you know, uh, a topwater frog in a clear reservoir it's 50 foot deep and you see the fisher on the graph and you can see it's crystal clear where there's no fish up shallow in the winter time yeah you probably don't want to throw a top water frog not saying it's impossible to catch a fish if he was up there in six inches of water and you brought the frog over his head there's a chance that you may catch him and if you run into that particular scenario you might be able to do that or work a popper or something but yes there is percentages for each bait via spring summer fall winter to where that bait tends to excel. So I'm gonna go over some of my particular favorite type of baits uh, to throw in the winter time and particular techniques in regards to those line and retrieval methods that's gonna help you because in the winter time you are fishing for way fewer bites than any time of year. Uh, granted that being said, the fish tend to be a lot bigger. The bite you can get in the winter can be substantially larger. So let's go into it. On the drop shot. There we go. Nice little start. That little dude was out in 12 foot of water. Okay, so we're gonna start off and doesn't matter what order here. A spinnerbait, okay? A lot of people don't throw spinnerbaits in the winter anymore. Uh, spinnerbaits excel in cold water. A lot of the time guys focus on throwing them in the spring or in the fall when there's bait fish around, but a spinnerbait can be very successful during the winter time. These fish pull out to the deepest parts or on rock ledges or near rock or near concrete that's warmer or the bottom of the lakes where they have a little dip in them. Like if you have a featureless lake, they're gonna be in that deepest spot. Um, and if you have got boulders, a lot of the time the fish will suspend next to the boulders. So a spinnerbait can be slow rolled across the bottom to target those fish and it can also catch suspended fish in the middle of that water column. The downside when the water gets extremely clear, uh, which happens a lot of the time in the winter, the spinnerbait doesn't do as good in crystal clear water. So one of the common variables is a swim bait. You know, you look at a swim bait like this, a lot of the time spinner baits and swim baits are used in the same sort of scenarios. Um, a lot of the time in the spring and fall, you're gonna find um, that these guys fit back to back in the calmer, slicker conditions, guys are using swim baits. And the same thing implies uh, with, you know, these soft poured swim baits like this with a little you know, paddle tail on the back, that if it's slick and calm and clear in the winter, you're gonna wanna go with that swim bait over the spinner bait. Uh, that being said, how it's raining like this, if a little bit of dirt or warmer water gets pushed up and those fish get closer to the bank and you have a little bit of stain in your water near that time, uh, if you have an inlet where water's dumping in, the spinner bait can oftentimes outfish that swim bait. So you wanna keep that in mind. This can be moved slower and it's more subtle, um, but with a spinner bait, they also do work substantially well. What you wanna look for on the blades, there's a cupping, a depth of the blade. The flatter the blade, the more it's gonna rotate at slower retrieval speeds. If you watch the Lake Oroville episode with Mark Lesane, you'll see that we talk about that. That shallow cupping, the slower you move the spinnerbait, the better it's gonna rotate at slower speeds, which is critical in that colder water. So here's a little bit about plastics. A lot of people say, you know, throw the drop shot in the winter. Yeah, drop shot works great. 
one thing you want to keep in mind is if you're in early fall, late fall, not quite winter yet, a lot of the time the bass are associating to bait fish higher in the water column to where you might want to set your drop shot two, even three feet up your leader. Uh, but a lot of the time when the bass get in winter mode, they start associating to the bottom, sitting in the bottom or looking down at the bottom. So there where my drop shot height here is six inches, a lot of the time in the winter, dead of winter, I will lower it down to an inch, two inches, three inches, and you will get more bites like that. Uh, the reason for it is when you get closer down to that weight and you're dragging it on the bottom, you're getting more response out of your bait. In the dead of winter, you're not really shaking it much to try to encourage a bite. You're just slowly dragging it. With that shorter dropper, bass looking down, you're right in front of their nose. When they're sitting on the bottom, three inches up is right in front of their face. They're opportunist feeders. When it's slowly moving just right there in front of their face, a lot of the time they cannot resist and they'll eat it that way. Uh, that being said, when I get closer to the bottom, if I have bigger, chunkier rocks, I'll use a little two or three O EWG hook in Texas rig it on there if I find that there's a lot of snags around. If it's a relatively smooth bottom, I'm gonna run a, a one, a two, or a one aught mosquito hook and nose hook that bait at that time. Man. Shaky head fish. <laughs> Old one eye. Hang with us guys, we'll be right back. Ever try pulling a planer board next to your boat when trolling or fishing from a swift current bank? If not, you're missing out on one of the most phenomenal fish catching machines on the market today. With Yellowbird planer boards pulling your lines perpendicular to your boat, you can't help but catch more fish. Find out more by visiting www.yellowbirdproducts.com. Attention Northern California anglers, have you been to Boat Country in Escalon with one of the largest selections of welded aluminum fishing boats from North River, Hughescraft, and now Crestliner? Chances are they have the right boat for you. And did I mention they have a full service center to take care of all your repair or boating maintenance needs? If you're a boat owner or just looking to become one, you owe it to yourself to check these guys out. Visit BoatCountryUSA.com or stop on by. We'll see you there. Hey guys, did you know that Juris Truly is now hosting Lucky Tackle Box's monthly pan fish instructionals? And aside from relentless fish catching, I'll be breaking down the rigging and the gear you need to get going along the way. And of course, a few extra tips to help you score more fish on the goodies included in your box. So remember, the tug is our drug. So go visit LuckyTackleBox.com and get signed up today. Oh, you heard they got weapons of big fish destruction? Well, you heard right. Biwa Fishing Performance is the newest company hit the U.S. market by storm. With some of the sickest swim baits around and non-cookie cutter style lures that you could ever get your hands on, it's time to show these fish something new. Visit BWA.com. Are you into diving, surfing, or fishing? And have you checked out the Salt Life YouTube channel yet? From awesome surfing insight to scuba diving locations and in and offshore fishing, bundled up with all sorts of crazy cool footage, the Salt Life has you ocean lovers covered. So go check out their YouTube channel and tell them if sent you. Did you know that Beeline makes specialized lines for all your fishing needs? From the super strong abrasive resistant CXX or the low stretch super stealthy CX Premium, or maybe you're looking for invisibility or super bite detection with Beeline's 100% fluorocarbon. No matter what your needs, Beeline's got it covered. To find out more, visit Beeline.com. Beeline, baby! Did you ever wish for an RC boat when you were a kid? And do you have a passion for fishing? Well, guess what? It's time to do them both at the same time. With RCFishingWorld.com's RC Fishing Pole, it's time to be a kid again. So visit www.rcfishingworld.com today. Here we go, baby. On that jig. Another good variable to that drop shot is a shaky head. The shaky head rig right here, I just got a little zoom trick worm on here. I'll just peel that off and show you what a shaky head looks like. It's just a little, this is a little ball head. They have plenty of different designs. Uh, the lighter you go, the more subtle it's going to be. If the fish are real lethargic, a lot of the time they pick up something too heavy, they won't hold it as long. So you can kind of, the lighter you go, you can fish it on spinning gear and lighter line. Uh, this right here is a quarter ounce one. I'm fishing down at 12 foot deep right now. Um, so I'm going a little bit heavier and we're throwing this on a bait caster. That being said, your worm just hooks into an upright position like that as you're retrieving. It keeps your worm up off of the bottom like that. You're retrieving, you are bumping into rocks, you're hitting everything, so your worm's getting kicked around a lot just off a straight drag retrieve. Yes, you can shake it a lot of the time, uh, but if it's an extra cold night, extra cold winter day to where just things are just so frigid, you don't see any life going around, slowly, slowly drag it. 
almost doing nothing with the plastic, just enough to get the plastic to subtly move is all you need. If you find that you're making a cast out there and you're back to the boat within 30 seconds, chances are you're going way too fast. You need to imagine that the bass is right here, you cast it in there, and this bass is almost as slow as a snail. Imagine in your head when you cast it out to that key spot. Another thing here, you want to fish spots where you know you've caught fish before and look for that deeper section near that spot. Look for a rock section near that spot, something they're gonna associate more to in the winter time. Uh, something where you know there's a higher percentage chance of you finding a bass. You don't wanna cover a lot of bank looking for a fish this time of year. You wanna go to your key stuffs and fish it very slow and methodical. Um, that being said, when you're down there, you wanna imagine that snail slowly creeping over. So you just kinda wanna move it in place more than actually retrieving it. That's gonna get you a whole lot more bites. Another bait that works substantially well in the winter time is a jig. Uh, this is a plastic trailer on here. Most of the time when that water gets close to 50 degrees, I'm switching over to a pork trailer. Um, you can watch those episodes like with Andy Kachia out there on the California Delta winter Delta bass featuring Andy Kachia. Go check that out. Um, Andy goes into a full breakdown of how to rig the pork um, and make the jig work better in the winter time. All we're doing is pretty much dragging it. Every now and then we'll do a slow little hop just to get the, the tails or the pinchers of your crawdad imitator to kick over like that. That slow drag is critical. You don't want to be hopping it, making big hops. They don't want something that looks like it's difficult to catch in the winter. Their metabolism slow down. Um, they're moving slower. They want an easier target. It looks like a bigger, bulkier profile late season crawfish will oftentimes turn dark. Uh, not all of them duck down into the mud sometimes. There's still random ones. I've gotten crawdads coming up on bait fishing rigs when I was out doing other films not for bass to where a big black and blue crawdad is hanging on to a chicken liver or a big chunk of sardine or something in January, February. And I'm like, what is that guy doing? And they are almost black and blue. So a late season pattern, black and blue, almost black and brown. In the spring, the crawdads tend to be a lot more brown, so keep that in mind. Uh, late, late winter, early spring, you might wanna use a brown. Um, early winter, black and blue, sometimes with a little bit of black and red hint to it, like the summertime crawdads with the red, but black and blue tends to work substantially well in the wintertime. Um, I'm using a half ounce jig in the wintertime. If I'm fishing, shallower than eight feet i'm fishing a quarter ounce jig uh, strictly because i want it to move slower i don't want a fast drop i don't want that speed i want that subtle movement and that's going to help a lot all right now with a moving bait a jerk bait great great winter time baits you want to pay close attention to your depth on a jerk bait this is a shallow run right here this is yellowbird sp 115. Um, i love throwing this bait it's a medium size it's about four and a half inches long um, I'll throw the big, big long one if I know there's big fish in the area or if I'm looking to get a bigger bite. I'm not necessarily always matching um, the size of the lure to the size of the bass, although that does work. Bigger the lure, bigger the fish is just how it works. A lot of the time in the winter time that big fish does want to eat, but he only wants to eat every couple of days. So yeah, you can still target that bigger fish with the bigger bait. Just less of them. You're naturally passing a smaller percentage of bigger fish and in the winter time does that big fish want to eat that you took the chance of passing? Uh, maybe, maybe not, but they still do eat. The advantage of a jerk bait in the winter time, when you're twitching it, you could twitch fast, twitch, twitch, pause, twitch, twitch, pause. That's more of a fall pattern. In the winter time, you want to tell yourself you're going to go out and you're going to twitch, twitch, pause. Over shallow rocky points, these work fantastic over deep rocky ledges they work fantastic but the pause is where you get the bass in the winter time we're talking about largemouth this is all associated around largemouth spotted bass and smallmouth um, they're a little bit more uh, spunky in the winter time they'll chase things down and you'll find out when you run into them um, at that point but the pause of the jerk bait is critical you always want to tell yourself when you start off in the winter you're going to take a minimal 10 second pause you're going to your cadence is the way you retrieve it. You're gonna one, you're gonna 10 second pause. You're gonna one, two, 10 second pause. One, two, three, 10 second pause. If you don't get bit and you know that's an area where you commonly catch bass, 
throw it out there and make that a 20 second pause. I'm not joking, 20 seconds is a long time, but on a suspending jerk bait, it's sitting right there, they might be right here, and it stops, and they come over, their buddy comes over, and then, oh, competition, boom, then they eat it at that point. And I have caught bass literally on pauses up to a minute long. Sometimes it gets down to that point, but it does work. So a jerk bait, you wanna make sure that you're within at least I would say five to ten feet of the piece of cover or structure you're targeting. If you know those rocks are 15 feet down there, you want to make sure you use like a bevy or something, something that's going to get down to about 10 feet to where you're close enough to those bass. You don't want them to come from a super long distance away, otherwise you're going to greatly decrease the percentage of bass you're targeting. So keep that in mind. The depth of your jerkbait is absolutely critical in the winter. When I'm out fishing the Delta, I'm usually within two or three feet of that targeted area, and I'm pausing for a long time. The longer they have to travel to get that bait, the less likely they are to bite it. Guys neglect to use crankbaits in the winter time. I'm here in California, so my water gets down roughly, I've seen it as low as like 45 to 47 degree range. I know in the Midwest it gets even colder than that, down into the 30s, um, where a crankbait might not be possible to use. If you want to try using a crankbait in the winter time, keep in mind that pause rule still applies. If you get down there and bang it into a rock, pause, just like a jerk bait, and let it kind of slowly float up at that point, sometimes they'll hit it. In the winter time, an object floating up, they don't hit it nearly as often as an object falling. The bait fish start to die off in the winter. Shad die off and they fall, and sometimes they kick back up, kick back up, but a lot of the time, uh, the bass are eating it when it's dying off. But a crankbait, the thing you want to pay attention to that it doesn't have a really wide displacement. If you look at the lip on a crankbait here, the more narrow, okay, the tighter it's going to wobble. You want a very, very tight wobble as the water's colder. In the spring, you want a tight wobble. In the winter, you want a tight wobble. In the late fall, you want a tight wobble. If that lip was double this wide, this bait is going to kick a lot. That's much more of a, of a warmer, you know, pre-spawn, right when they're getting up roaming, that would work good, but in the winter time, you want a very tight wobble, and you want a bait with thin sides. It's gonna displace not much water, very thin, not as erratic. It doesn't seem like a difficult meal, but it's still a bait fish getting down there to them. So thin sides and a tighter wobble, not a wide wobble, if you're gonna use a crankbait. Keep in mind, you're gonna tend to probably move it a lot faster than you would think. So make at least 10, you know, to 15 casts to that same area that you would think, you only wanna focus on changing your angle. And a lot of the time when you make that impact, pause it. You always wanna change your angle. Don't repeat the same cast. If you are gonna repeat the same cast, lift your rod tip up, try a shallower pass, point your rod tip straight, try a medium pass, put your rod tip under the water, try a lower pass if you're gonna repeat that same cast. And that should trigger a couple extra strikes for you. Now, just like the diving crankbait, we have a lipless crankbait. This is a rattle trap here. Thin profile. Now the advantage here is you can rip these up and let them fall like a bait fish. You can almost use it like a flutter spoon or a jigging spoon. You can rip it up and let it fall. Rip it up and let it fall. It's got thin sides. You can control your depth on your retrieve strictly by the speed. It'll fall deeper the slower you retrieve it. That allows you, if you're in an area and you have you know, rocks that you're fishing at 10 feet, rocks that you're fishing at 20, rocks that you're fishing at 30, um, you don't want to probably fish a controlled depth bait. You wanna fish a bait that you can control the depth strictly by the way you retrieve it. Um, that's gonna allow you the freedom to hunt down those fish that may be shallow, may be medium, may be deep. Um, once you have them pegged down, let's say they're all at eight feet and this thing's running five feet or seven feet, well, now you know you got a weapon that's gonna work for that as well as this, um, but uh, a lipless crankbait can be a phenomenal surge bait that time of year. Uh, thinner and lighter, it's going to move slower in that water column. Keep in mind the fish are colder, lethargic, but you can catch suspended fish with these. You pull up to the outside of a rock pile, you see that they're in 10 feet and it's in 30 feet of water. Well, now you got suspended fish. You can either throw a swim bait like this. Um, if it's slimy stained, you can throw a spinner bait. Um, you can bring a rattle trap through there. You can bring the jerk bait through there. There's a lot of things you can bring through to draw those fish, but the slower and the more drawing power is critical to get them to bite. I wanna talk about suspended fish a little bit more too. 
A lot of the time in the winter time, we're throwing jigging spoons or flutter spoons. I'll throw one a lot bigger than this. This is a little half ounce P-line laser minnow. But depending on, if I'm looking at my fish finder, and if I see a ball of fish, or I'm right over a point and I see them, I'll drop a little jigging spoon right down there and just do little subtle hopping motions, or I'll put it right on the bottom and just barely turn it over just to where it looks like a wounded bait fish, something that they can see just stuck in the water column. It's not a retrieve. It's just there jigging right in front of them to where eventually they're going to say, I can't ignore this opportunity, and they're going to eat it. Uh, on the other hand, you have a flutter spoon. If I see the fish are loosely all over, if I have fish at 10 feet, 15, 12, 25, I'll throw a flutter spoon out to them. Something like this Dr. Spoon 175, the thin doctor right here. Really thin, light, looks like a big bait, bait fish, has very little displacement, and will fall through the water column substantially slow. You can throw it out there, let it fall, rip it up, let it fall again, rip it up, let it fall to where you can cover more of that water column to target those fish. In these clear water reservoirs, Berryessa, Maloney's, Comanche, uh, flutter spoons work great. I want to do a special just on those someday for you guys to show you a little bit more about that. One thing um, that you're not going to see on a lot of videos because a lot of the videos aren't made on the West Coast, us West Coast guys like to throw big swim baits in the wintertime. Um, that being said, you know, you can have a slow sink S action like this big BYS trout, the 7.5 right there, or a glide bait like this, something that has that pattern going, you know, side to side, which tends to draw bass in the wintertime. Um, look at the size of these things. Okay, you're generally not going to get a little fish to come eat these. Swim baits have drawing power when the water is clear. Clear water tends to, uh, the, you know, the bass can see it from a further range. He is more than likely going to travel after something slower moving. If you're not getting followers on middle of the water column baits like this, if you're throwing on big points, you're throwing over, you know, a flat that's 12 foot deep, and you're not seeing a follower, you know right away a swim bait is an awesome tool. It's clear. A lot of the time you'll see the bass following. That could mean that those are suspended fish. If you use that swim bait as a search tool, well, now you know I might be able to get them on a jerk bait. Um, I might be able to get them on a smaller swim bait to get them to eat it because they're intrigued by the bigger bait. If you don't see that happening, more than likely they're sitting on the bottom. So now you have a clue, jig. You know there's fish in that area. Now you got the clue, shaky head. Um, you know, uh, maybe a spoon. You can go graph over there, see if they're deeper. Um, drop it right down in front of them. Or you happen to see them following these big swim baits and you catch one on it. Bigger bait bigger fish, a lot of the time they're only looking for that one meal every couple of days, and a meal this size is going to sustain them probably for a week. Um, they might make the effort for this where they wouldn't for this. Um, this is a couple of french fries, this is a double whopper right here. You gotta think, risk versus reward, if they're gonna go get it, that big giant big girl, that one 8, 9, 10, 12, 15 pounder you happen to go by is more likely gonna eat this than this but you're only gonna pass maybe one or two of those in that day time, uh, you know, in that day out fishing. And that may be what she wanted at that time versus this. So understand you may wing all day for one or two bites on this where you could get four, five, six bites on this, but you may not get the big girl because this did not appeal to her. So keep that in mind, guys. That's a lot of bait tips right there. Ah, one more thing I wanna mention. The float and fly is something that's taken off a lot more on the West Coast. Um, a lot of guys used to do it in the Midwest. It's basically just using a bobber, okay? And you look at fish on your graph and you can see fish down at 10 foot deep. Um, I like to use a slip bobber, not a spring style bobber like that. The slip bobber allows you to control your depth. If you see fish at 15 foot deep, set your slip bobber to 14 foot. And when the guys say float and fly in bass fishing, they're not talking about a fly that you use in fly fishing like a woolly bugger or a nymph or anything like that. They're actually talking about crappie jigs, little hair jigs, little tiny crappie jigs, uh, even a little tiny grub on a 164th ounce jig head or a 132nd uh, ounce jig head, a little tiny grub under a float. And all they're doing is throwing it over suspended fish that are next to rock ledges or out over the top of a tree and they're sitting there twitching that float just to keep it in place, almost like a a jigging spoon but it's more subtle and it stays right in the middle of them and you can stay away from those fish so they don't feel the boat pressure. So keep that in mind guys, that's a lot of different tips for you there. So one of the things I see 
often neglected when it comes to talking about wintertime bass is line choice. A lot of the time, if you have to go deeper, you're going to have to go to that thinner diameter. A lot of guys are scared to get down. Some guys will fish jigs on 10 pound tests. Makes me nervous, man. The minimal I go is like 12. But yes, uh, what's going to happen is they're going to get down to the bottom faster on 10 pound tests. Uh, the bait's going to move a lot more subtle and naturally on that lighter line, um, which is going to help a lot of the time get you those um, extra bites. The lighter line's going to get you the extra bites. But the thing I really want to talk about is line choice. I see a lot of guys fishing copolymers on bottom baits in the wintertime. These fish, oftentimes, just out today, these fish will pick up a jig like this. They'll just suck it off the bottom and sit there and barely do this. If you have a line with any stretch in it at all, you really don't detect it a lot of the time until it's too late or you see them swimming off. In the winter time, I'm using 100% fluorocarbon or I'm using braid with a top shot, which is just like a longer distance, a fluorocarbon leader or a fluorocarbon leader, you know, a few feet long. The reason for that is I have very, very low stretch. It's less than 3% with fluorocarbon, which is going to allow me to detect it. If I make a 100 foot cast out there and something picks up my jig, I'm either gonna feel all of a sudden it's real light, like I don't feel nothing, so I'll reel down and pay attention to my line, or I'll you know, notice something's different, like I'm not touching the bottom anymore. It's gonna give me a faster indicator to let me know that the fish is there. Uh, versus a spongy line, I make it cast 80 to 100 feet out there and I got 20% stretch with a copolymer or a mono, I'm not detecting it nearly in time. The fish could have had it 20 or 30 seconds by then, detected and spit it out, and I lost my opportunity at the few strikes I'm going to get during the winter. So use a low stretch line, guys. A lot of the time, too, when I'm out there fishing in the winter, I'll cast out there, and let me kind of bring this in view. I'll oftentimes have my finger, too, on the line. Like I'll pull it back away from the spool a little bit for extra bite detection. And the same thing, I'll oftentimes in the winter time hold my rod in a higher position versus in the summer I'll have it lower to the water till I'm ready for that hook set, that fast grab, harder hook set. But in the winter time I'll have my rod up and dragging it because I'll get better detection of the bottom. As my rod's in a higher position, I have more line against the blank of the rod to where I can feel it rubbing things. Then when I feel them grab it, I'll reel down then set the hook on them at that point. Um, but the same thing, when I'm using a spinning rod, I'm gonna be dragging it and I'm gonna have my finger on the line for that extra bite detection. That's absolutely critical, so keep it in mind. Now, when it comes to choosing areas to bass fish in the winter, yes, I said you wanna go to areas that you know that the fish are feeding. Keep in mind when you're going, I mean, areas where you know you've caught fish before and more than likely they're still there. You need to keep in mind, you want to go to the area that gets the most sun. You know, if you're in an area of the lake that you catch them in the summertime that rarely ever, rarely ever gets sun, chances are they're going to be harder to catch there, whether they're still there or not, versus an area that gets more sun. Uh, a difference of two to three degrees in the wintertime can make a difference in one or two extra bites. So go to an area that gets a lot more sun. Um, that being said, if you're fishing an overcast day, yeah, maybe they're still in that area, but that kind of keeps everything on an even keel. So you want to keep in mind that all your spots may apply that day. Um, in the wintertime, bluebird sky days are better than overcast days. Like in, in the summertime, we get an overcast day, the fish are going to move away from that cover to grab your bait that's flying by. Uh, works a lot better. But on the sunny, sunny, warmer winter days, those fish tend to move shallow. Um, those fish tend to get tighter to those rocks that, that are going to have more warmth. They're definitely going to associate to that warmer area when you have a bluebird sky day. So look for that difference. You know, if you find that the north end of the lake is five or six degrees warmer or even two degrees warmer, that can make a subtle difference. A, a really bright wall, you're coming down the lake, you see a rock wall that's got a ton of sun on it, pull up there, check it out, make a couple casts, look at your graph. If you see fish on your graph, come back later if you think you pressured them off with the boat. And those fish might still be there and actively feeding. Um, so you need to keep it in mind, it kind of works the opposite of summer. The sunny, sunny days are gonna work to your benefit. Also, later in the day, the water is going to become warmer. Um, 
So you kind of work at the opposite. A lot of the time in the summer, we'll fish a bigger bait um, early when it's low light in its prime feeding window. In the winter time, a lot of the time, I'll start off fishing very, very subtle in the morning. I'll start off with my worms, a drop shot, a shaky head, a slow moving swim bait creeping in across the bottom or a jig versus later in the day, when that water warms up a little bit, I'll start using a jerk bait. I'll start throwing a thin sided crankbait because the water's warming up. The fish might be more in tune to chasing a bait. That might be a better opportunity or time of day for them to go get a meal. So keep it in mind, you're gonna kind of work backwards, more subtle when it's early and cold as that water warms up in the day. You might be able to get more away with uh, a bigger bait. Some, you know, that time of day where a big one is gonna go eat is later. It's warmer in the winter, later in the day. If it's overcast, it's probably not gonna make a difference. So you'll probably have to go subtle, subtle, subtle all day. So I wanna show you guys a mistake, something I call uh, line shocking or guitar stringing. And a lot of guys will cast out there. And in the winter time, you always wanna make sure it falls all the way to the bottom. Don't pendulum it back. You know, let it get down there. Now, I got my jig on the bottom, okay? Now, you see how it's slack line? If I go to move my jig by hitting it like that, I'm line shocking. The line's going boom, boom. I'm drawing attention to the line. Um, the fish want something super subtle. They want it to be moving subtle. You want them to focus on your bait. The chances of getting those bites are few, far, and in between in the winter. You want them to focus 100% on the bait. So what I'll do is I'll reel up to my bait to where I don't shock the line, and I'll hop it to where I'm not drawing attention to my line. I'm strictly drawing attention to my bait, get a tight line, hop it like that. That will get you extra bites with that going on. So don't shock it. Don't bong, bong. You can feel it. You hear the rod too. As I hit it, you can hear it, okay? That subtleness is gonna draw a lot of attention to your line. It's gonna take the attention away from your bait versus getting a tight line and hopping it. There's no shock. 100% focus on your bait. You have to do that in the winter time. If you do not do that, you're going to decrease the chances of you getting a bite. Okay, so now I'm gonna show you the retrieve with the shaky head. Okay, in the fall, in the spring, you can get away with those hops and that line shock, okay, that I talked about. But same thing you wanna do, tight line, hop it, or just slowly reel it, give it slack every now and then. Slowly reel it, give it slack every now and then. The tight line oftentimes will keep that, that shaky head upright. If you let it slack, it'll fall, which gives your worm a little extra added action on a kill. So basically your tight line hopping, then you're reeling and you're slack lining it. Now I want you to imagine this as a drop shot, okay? We got a bottom weight, we got a worm suspended on a hook right here. Most people make the problem too, uh, they make the mistake of going tight on a drop shot and shaking it on a tight line. Never ever shake a drop shot on a, tight on a tight line. I don't care what time of year it is, it's a mistake. Come up to a tight line, drop it down, and basically work the slack. So you're not shocking that line whatsoever. Work the slack, because remember, when you feel a tight line, that's because your line's tight all the way to that weight. The worm is up from there, so if you work the slack line, you're actually dancing the worm without drawing any attention to the bottom of the rig or the line. You could drag it, always drag a drop shot with it upright to where you could feel that bottom detection and you know your bait's as high up from that line as possible. If you keep your rod low and you retrieve it, you're actually changing the angle of the worm up here on the drop shot versus the weight like this uh, versus that higher angle will keep your hook more upright instead of pulling forward. Therefore, if the fish grabs it, you got a better chance of him turning with your rod in upright position and getting himself. So let me show you something here. I'm gonna cast it back out. Imagine this is the drop shot again. Now, how I work a drop shot back, a lot of guys will come down to here and start reeling it. I never ever do that with a drop shot. My drop shot, I'm always right here, like right around 10 o'clock, I'll drag it up here, I'll work that slack, I'll drag that tight line to 12 o'clock, now I'll reel it back down here to 10 o'clock, work the slack, drag it on a tight line, work the slack, okay? Now that being said, if I'm up here at 12 o'clock and he bites me, I don't just want to reel it all of a sudden. With the drop shot, you're always using light line, 
you're either using an exposed hook or a tiny light wire EWG hook. Either way, a very light hook set's gonna penetrate the fish. You're up here at 12 o'clock, he hits it, reel down, it's a little worm, they're gonna hang on to it for a while, reel down, get your line tight on the fish, and then just sweep into them. A nice sweeping upright, just a heavy pull is gonna penetrate that fish versus shocking it on a light line where you could weaken your knot, weaken your line, potentially break that fish off where you never needed to do that. That subtle, load down till you feel them and lean back on them with some weight, lean back on them with some weight is gonna penetrate that hook. You have a much higher hook up to land ratio like that. Now I wanna show you something critical to your jerk bait retrieve. We already talked about the pausing cadence. I'm gonna go ahead and throw it out there. One thing you wanna notice when you twitch, twitch, I see a lot of guys after the twitch move their reel to pick up slack line. That's a problem. When you twitch, twitch, your bait's already in some sort of suspended motion. If you start to slowly reel, you're gonna continue the glide of your bait versus it actually stopping. You want it to stop, okay? Your indicator of the strike is in your slack line. You're gonna throw it out there and you're gonna twitch one time and you're waiting on a strike. I'm letting slack into my line and I'm focusing on my slack. Now, I'm gonna pick up a little bit, one, two, and I'm gonna give slack back again. When I fire that slack back at it, it's going to stop that bait. The bait's gonna twitch, twitch, and it's gonna stop. You do not wanna one, two, three, and do this. Do not have a tight line. You're gonna pull your bait forward and you're gonna decrease the amount of strikes you get. Way too common, I see that mistake taking place when you're out throwing a jerk bait. Trust me, you will get a few extra strikes by leaving slack and watching it. One, one, two, and give it slack. And watch that slack. That's all you gotta do. When you see that slack start to take off, reel into it and just sweep. You got little, little tiny treble hooks on there, that'll penetrate the fish. Don't jam it home. You got a bunch of little hook points. You just need to lean on them. All right, guys, keep in mind, it's winter time. These fish are so cold and lethargic. Please don't keep them out of the water an extra long time to get pictures of them. Have your camera ready. Don't live well the fish. It's gonna put extra added stress on them. Get them out, take a picture real quick, or hold them back in the water. Don't keep them out. They can't suffer a lot during the winter time and survive. Get them out, take the picture, get them back in, let them go. Well, I hope these tips helped out, you guys. There's Trust me, there's probably 20 other baits you can use in the winter time. Don't think that you have to follow any particular rule. A lot of the time, trying something completely different outside the box. I didn't even show a, a vibrating jig. A lot of the time, you can drag that across the bottom in the winter time and get them. Don't outrule any bait. Just keep in mind, these fish are cold. These fish are lethargic. You have to get it there and it has to stay there for a good amount of time to get them to bite or you have to make multiple presentations or you have to draw them to it with a bigger, slower presentation. I'm Nick the Informative Fisherman. Visit www.informativefisherman.com. Hit me up on Facebook, Instagram. I appreciate you guys watching. We'll see you next time. Start it.